forms are integer points. So uh, you can shut the door. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for this uh, kind invitation. I would have loved to be there in person, but uh, circumstances are such that my visit will have to wait for some time. Um, I'm uh, an ergodic theorist who likes to dabble in number theory. So I've chosen uh, a topic today, which uh, I hope will showcase how these two subjects interact. So um, I'll, I'll proceed and try to uh, go slowly, but please, feel free to interrupt uh, whenever you want. Don't, don't wait till the end. If you want to ask me a question, just go ahead right away. Okay, so uh, the title is uh, Values of Quadratic Forms at Integer Points. And so let me start with some uh, classical results. So, uh, all right, so basically, uh, you know, when we were uh, in school, we learned how to solve uh, quadratic equations. And, and we were given a nice uh, formula about how to do this. And uh, that's great. But somehow one of the main uh, central problems in number theory is how to find the integer solutions to polynomial equations, right? So uh, this is one way of putting it. Another way of putting it is uh, how to find uh, integer points on, uh, you know, surfaces defined by polynomial equations. This is a very central theme in, in number theory. Um, so we're mainly going to talk about quadratic forms. And in quadratic forms, there's a very classical theorem due to Meyer. And I've uh, goofed up by uh, missing a hypothesis here. So the correct statement of Meyer's theorem is an indefinite rational quadratic form. It's missing the hypothesis indefinite here. An indefinite rational quadratic form in at least five variables has a non-trivial integer solution, okay? So let's unpack this statement. The statement says that if you take a quadratic form in five variables, with say integer coefficients, right? So x squared minus 5y squared plus 3z squared plus 220u squared plus v squared is an example. This quadratic form has five variables. It has integer coefficients and it's indefinite. Okay, so it takes both positive and negative values. Okay. Under these circumstances, the quadratic form always has a non-trivial integer solution. So this is a, a very nice theorem. Uh, there's a book, a very nice book called A Course in Arithmetic by Sam. And you can find this uh, theorem in the, in the first chapter of this book. This is a consequence of what one calls the Hasse-Minkowski local global principle. Okay, so uh, this theorem is already, you know, more than a hundred years old, okay? And uh, what happened was that uh, there was a British mathematician called Oppenheim. He's, he's kind of a, he's an interesting character. He was a very good mathematician. He was also a good uh, administrator. So he was, um, he was the vice chancellor of the National University of Singapore, for example. But anyway, so uh, Oppenheim around uh, the year 1930 was studying quadratic forms, okay? And uh, he asked himself, okay, what if I change some of the hypothesis in Meyer's theorem? So instead of having a rational quadratic form, what if I have an irrational quadratic form? So what if one of the coefficients is the square root of two, say? What would happen, right? So if you're, if you're, you know, if you're an optimistic person, then you, you could say, well, uh, it's too much to expect a, a non-trivial integer solution to an equation with uh, an irrational coefficient. But maybe 
if the circumstances are uh, suitable, I can solve, I can get as close to zero as possible. Okay. So he made a, a conjecture, which was a direct analog of Meyer's theorem and said that if I have an irrational indefinite quadratic form in at least five variables, then I don't have an integer solution, but I can get close to any point on the real line using an integer vector. In other words, the set of integer, the set of values taken at integer points by this quadratic form forms a dense subset of the real line. Okay. After he made this conjecture, he realized that in fact, uh, one doesn't, uh, you know, this conjecture could be made for forms of um, in three or more variables, not, not just five or more variables. And uh, he also realized that it's false in two variables. We'll come to that. Okay, so this is uh, the main, one of the main problems that we want to discuss. What happens if, uh, hi, Purva, yes? So I had a naive question, sorry. Uh, just, uh, so when you say irrational, uh, you mean at least one entry in that matrix is irrational? Or yeah, so uh, what I mean is, maybe I have it on the next uh, point. So what I mean is uh, that, uh, so I, I'll call a quadratic form rational if it's a, multi, a real multiple of a form with integer coefficients. So if, in other words, it's C right. times Q naught, where C is a real number, right. and irrational okay. otherwise. Otherwise, okay, great. So then when you say that this is at least three variables, yes. uh, is it it's pretty much probably enough to uh, say that if you know it for three variables, you know it for any higher number because- Yeah, yeah of course, of course, uh, Purva, okay. as, as usual, two slides ahead. <laughs> you're right, you're right, you're right, okay. absolutely. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so uh, here's an example of an irrational quadratic form. Uh, you know, as and as Apurva pointed out, it's good to make a definition. So let me make a definition on this page. So when I say a rash, uh, when I call a quadratic form rational, I mean that it's going to be a form of the form C times Q naught where C is a real non-zero real number. And Q naught is a quadratic form with integer coefficients, okay? So for me, this is a rational quadratic form. In other words, if I take an integer quadratic form and then multiply all the coefficients by pi, that's cheating. So that's not an irrational quadratic form. That's still a rational quadratic form. Okay, so uh, I want the quadratic forms to be genuinely rational in the sense that they should not be of this form. All right, so uh, let's have a quick, uh, you know, check of uh, why this uh, conjecture of Oppenheim makes sense. So if I take a rational quadratic form, which is, of, uh, which is a multiple of an integer quadratic form, and I plug in uh, the integer lattice into this quadratic form, then uh, basically this is all going to, the set of values this takes is going to be, uh, you know, essentially integers, right? So there's no chance, it's going to be a discrete set, no matter what. And so there's no chance of it being dense. And so Oppenheim's conjecture presents kind of a dichotomy. It says that if you have a rational quadratic form, then you get a discrete set of values. If you have an irrational quadratic form, you uh, should get a dense set of values. Okay, so this is the this is a kind of the dichotomy presented in the rational irrational setting for quadratic form. Okay, so let me make some remarks. So the first thing is that this is false in two variables. Oppenheim's conjecture. This is quite easy to see because uh, you can cook up examples such as. Uh, taking a binary quadratic form with a coefficient which has some special diaphragm type properties. So there are lots of uh, numbers which have a property that 
they are kind of badly approximated by rational numbers. Okay, and if you take up one of these, it's very easy to see that uh, you are going to kind of stay away from zero. So you can't take a dense set of values. And uh, this, uh, this, there are lots of counter examples. So somehow there is like a, a full house dog dimension worth of counter examples in two variables. Okay. So it's uh, uh, false in two variables. And one could hope that it might be true, true in three or more. So before I continue, is the statement of the conjecture here? So uh, all of today's talk is going to be variations on this particular statement. So I would just like to check once if everyone's happy with the conjecture. Okay, so it's uh, very easy to state. It's just an indefinite quadratic form with some uh, irrational coefficients. And the statement is that, conjecture is that, uh, it should take a dense set of values when you plug in the integer lattice. In there. That's all. Okay, so uh, around uh, the time that Oppenheim, is there a question from the audience? No? Okay. So after Oppenheim made this conjecture, there was a lot of uh, work on this by. Uh, mathematicians, uh, especially from the British School of Analytic Number Theory, which was uh, thriving and still is. So for example, it's known, uh, it was proved by Chawla that such a theorem is known uh, for diagonal forms in at least nine variables, and by Davenport and Heilbronn in at least five variables also for diagonal forms and then so on and so forth. So um, by around the time, uh, you know, if we come up to the 1970s, the record was held by Davenport and Redo, and they could prove the conjecture for all variable, all quadratic forms, irrational forms in at least 21 variables, okay? So now we come to Apurva's uh, observation, very astute observation that in fact, uh, proving Oppenheim's conjecture, one can, one only has to prove it for three variables. Once you know it for three variables, you automatically get it for uh, all higher number of variables, okay? So this is just an observation. And now we have basically, uh, the, the first few slides, we started around, uh, the turn of the last century with Myers' theorem progressed to the 1930s when Oppenheim made his conjecture. And now we find ourselves uh, in the 19, late 1970s, where uh, the record at this point is held by Davenport and uh, Redo. Okay, so now uh, something uh, quite uh, interesting happens, which is that. Uh, the place where I work in, the Tata Institute, uh, someone, and I haven't been able to find out who this person is, gives a talk on Oppenheim's conjecture here. Okay. And uh, so in the audience is uh, M.S. Raghunathan. And when Raghunathan hears of this uh, problem and uh, sees that and listens to the talk, he realizes that uh, there's a completely different topic, which is the ergodic theory of group actions. And he realizes that these two are closely related. In fact, he proposes a conjecture in the ergodic theory of group actions, which, would, which implies Oppenheim's conjecture. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a beautiful connection and this connection was vital in uh, the eventual solution of Oppenheim's conjecture. So at the time, Raghunathan uh, was, you know, he had a very famous student, namely uh, S.G. Dani. Dani was working on ergodic theory of group actions. And so there was, uh, you know, uh, there, was, there was something in the air at the time. So it was, a, it was you know, which facilitated this beautiful observation. So let me briefly explain uh, what this uh, 
ergodic theory of group actions is, it's, it's a very simple kind of subject. And, uh, you know, ergodic theory, it's, it's kind of uh, trying to study group actions on spaces with uh, measures on them, okay? That's what it is, roughly speaking. So we are only going to be concerned with uh, one or two uh, probability spaces. And the first one is uh, the space uh, SLNR factor SLN Z, okay? So uh, SLNR is just the group of uh, n by n matrices with real entries and determinant one, okay? The special linear group. And uh, it turns out that uh, this uh, discrete subgroup of SLNR, namely the group with integer entries, uh, forms uh, uh, what is called a lattice inside SLNR, okay? So what this means is that uh, this uh, SLNZ is a discrete subgroup of SLNR. And moreover, uh, this quotient, when you take this quotient, so let me uh, actually start with uh, the circle, right? So if you take uh, R, the real line, and quotient out by uh, the integers, you get the circle, right? So it's a nice uh, compact space, okay? So, um, it's a very general theorem of uh, Borel and Harish Chandra that this uh, trick of uh, producing a nice uh, compact space actually can be, uh, you can do the same trick using a very wide class of algebraic groups, okay? So uh, in this particular case, what happens is that this quotient is not really compact. But it's the next best thing to be compact, namely the space has a finite SLNR invariant probability measure. So it's you can normalize it to make it a probability space. Okay, so this is the probability space, and this is the space where uh, all our action is going to happen. And it's an important thing to note that there is another description of the space. Namely, that you can think of it as the space of co-volume one lattices in Rn in the following very uh, simple uh, manner. So uh, if I ask you to name a co-volume one lattice in Rn, the favorite choice, everybody's favorite choice will be the integer lattice, Zn, right? And uh, if I want to now produce another co-volume one lattice, I can multiply all the vectors of my integer lattice with an n by n matrix, right? But I can only do that in a way which doesn't change the volume of the fundamental uh, parallelogram or the square or whatever of the integer lattice, which means that the matrix should have determinant one, okay? So what I'm trying to say in words is that the group SNMR acts transitively on the space of unimodular lattices in Rn. And the stabilizer of the integer lattice is SLNZ. And so by the orbit stabilizer theorem, you can think of, uh, you can identify SLNR factor SLNZ with the space of unimodular lattices in Rn. Okay. So uh, then what you do is you look at uh, subgroups of SLNR, which just act by left multiplication on SLNR factors. That's the dynamics that we are going to consider. Okay, so it turns out to be a very rich class of dynamics. And uh, Raghunathan made the following beautiful observation. He said that Oppenheim's conjecture about quadratic forms would follow from the following statement. And the statement is that uh, uh, any, so if I take a quadratic form Q, I can uh, look at its stabilizer group, special orthogonal group associated to this quadratic form, which I call here SOQ, okay? So these are all uh, matrices in SL3R 
which leaves this quadratic form invariant. And Raghunathan, this, this is a subgroup of SL3R, and this acts on the space SL3R factor SL3Z by left multiplication. And Raghunathan made the, uh, made, uh, made the following observation. If you can show that every orbit of this SOQ action is either closed and carries an SOQ invariant probability measure or is dense, this statement would imply Oppenheim's conjecture. Okay, so this is uh, at first, if you've never seen this kind of thing before, it looks a little peculiar. So let me try to uh, explain why this is kind of a remarkable statement to make. So, uh, you know, ergodic theory is kind of uh, a study of the long-term behavior of um, systems which are complicated, complex systems, right? So it started off in statistical physics. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Boltzmann is the, is the physicist famous Austrian physicist who first coined the term ergodic hypothesis. And uh, so the, the ergodic hypothesis is that if you want to study a complicated system, like the molecules of a gas or something, and you're struggling to do this because of uh, the fact that it's very complicated, then instead you might try to predict the long range behavior of, of these particles. <clears throat> and so a feature in ergodic theory is that <clears throat> one tries, one aims to make uh, probabilistic statements. Okay, so in, instead of, it, it might be very difficult to say something about uh, what every single point in a complicated system is trying to do, but perhaps you can say something intelligent about uh, with probability one or with high probability about how these uh, systems behave in the long run. So <clears throat> it, it turns out that this, the statement that Raghunathan made is a much stronger form. Of this. So it, it's, he doesn't want to know what happens for almost every orbit of this group action. He wants to know something about every single orbit of this group action. Okay, so this is a very special kind of statement. And the reason uh, why one might have suspected that such a statement uh, would be true at the time that Raghunathan made the conjecture is that if you take a quadratic form as in Oppenheim's conjecture, then, so if you take a three variable indefinite quadratic form, then its stabilizer is going to be a conjugate of the group SO21. Okay, so this group is locally, uh, you should think of this as locally isomorphic to SL2R. Okay, so uh, the reason that this is, uh, I say this is because the most important thing about this uh, group is that it's generated by unipotent one parameter subgroup. Okay. So what does it mean? What's an, if you take uh, the group um, uh, SL2R, right? Two by two invertible matrices. Then there's a special group inside it, which is the upper triangular group. Okay, so one X zero one. This is an example of a unipotent one parameter subgroup. Okay. And these, uh, groups had been studied earlier by Fustenberg and Dani and by Leach. And they proved that for SL2R factor SL2Z, orbits of unipotent one parameter subgroups were uh, strikingly rigid. So one could, in other words, one could potentially describe uh, all the orbits, not just almost every orbit. Okay, so is a very special class of subgroups. So what Raghunathan uh, said was that, okay, if you know that unipotent one parameter subgroups uh, behave very 
rigidly for uh, SL to R factor SL to Z, maybe one could hope that a similar statement could be true for the action of the orthogonal group on SL3 R factor SL3. And indeed, if you're able to prove something like this, you'd get Oppenheim's conjecture. Okay, so uh, in, in fact, he didn't stop at SL3. He conjectured a very general version of this uh, topological rigidity over here, the statement here, uh, for you know arbitrary sensible name groups and so on and so forth. And uh, after he made this observation connecting uh, quadratic forms to uh, dynamics on the space of lattices, Margulis was told of this connection of Raghunathan's observation. And once Margulis heard of Raghunathan's observation, he managed to solve this conjecture. He managed to prove that any orbit of SQ is either closed and carries a finite invariant probability measure or is dense. Okay. And thereby, in around the year 1983-84, he solved Oppenheim's conjecture. I'll tell you a little bit in the coming slide about why uh, these two are connected, so that it makes a little more uh, sense. Um, around the time, right after Dagunathan made these conjectures, which are topological in nature, Dani made a a similar uh, uh, conjecture in the measure category. So he made a rigidity conjecture about invariant ergodic measures uh, for uh, actions of univocal flows. And in uh, uh, landmark uh, development around 1990, Marina Ratner settled uh, both these, the, both the conjectures of Raghunathan and Dan. Okay, so let's uh, try to uh, unravel why quadratic forms will have anything to do with these uh, group actions. So let's uh, begin with a quadratic form, which is Q naught. And this just X squared plus Y squared minus Z squared. Okay, so this is a nice quadratic form. And uh, if I take a quadratic form in, as in uh, Margulis's theorem, or Oppenheim's conjecture, then I can write this quadratic form as a real number times Q naught of a GV. So there's this, there's this three by three matrix. So given another quadratic form, I can find a three by three matrix and a real number, such that this uh, quadratic form is written as lambda times Q naught of G. This quadratic form Q naught has stabilizer, which is SO2 one. And our new quadratic form has stabilizer, which is a conjugate by the same G of SO2 one. Okay, so far so good. And now we begin the dynamic. So we take uh, the stabilizer of Q naught SO2 one, and we look at its action on G mod gamma, where G is SL3R and gamma is SL3 z. Okay, so now uh, let's see what's happening. So here's the space G mod gamma. I'm interested in the values taken by a quadratic form called Q. Okay, this Q, uh, since I'm fixing a Q naught, this Q comes with uh, three by three matrix little g, right, attached to it. So the quadratic form comes with a three by three matrix. This three by three matrix g gives me a coset, a point on this quotient space, okay? So when I uh, want to study a quadratic form q, I automatically get a point on my, a special point on this homogeneous space, corresponding to my quadratic form. And the, the game is to take this special point attached to my quadratic form and move it around using the orthogonal group SO2. Okay, and this is going to tell us something about the values taken by the quadratic form Q. All right, 
So <clears throat> let's uh, see what happens if, when I move <clears throat> this point around by the orthogonal group, what if I get a dense orbit, okay? So this is one of the uh, things in Raghunathan's observation that you might get a dense orbit. So if you get a dense orbit, in other words, if H G gamma is dense in G, then uh, when I look at the set of integer uh, values taken at integer points by Q, this is just, uh, so you know, since uh, Q and Q naught are related by G, this is just G times at three. And uh, I plug in, uh, you know, G comma Z3. So this is just uh, going to be the set of values of Q naught applied to G times Z3, G is SL3 R. So this is just R3 minus the origin. And so uh, <clears throat> this is just a set of real numbers. All the equalities here, every single one of them is not, uh, is not, it's kind of uh, cheating. So there's, uh, you know, sometimes it's almost an equality, equality. Sometimes I need to take a closure, for example, in this case. Okay, so this is a hand wavy slide, but this is the idea. If you have a dense orbit, then you're going to get everything in the closure. All right. Okay, what happens if you have a discrete orbit or if you have a closed orbit with an SOQ invariant probability measure? Then it turns out that, uh, in fact, having an S being closed and having an invariant probability measure is uh, saying that gamma intersected with the conjugate of uh, SO21 by G is a lattice in this group. So gamma intersected with the stabilizer of Q, with the orthogonal group of Q is a lattice in the orthogonal group. Okay, this is it. This this is essentially the same statement. And uh, one can then apply this uh, uh, classical theorem called the Bonnet density theorem to conclude that the orthogonal group of Q is contained in the Zariski closure of this lattice. Okay. But this is only possible. <coughs> so gamma is SL3Z. So this is only possible if the orthogonal group of Q as an algebraic group is defined over Q. Okay. And this means that Q cannot be rational in the sense that we define. So this is the connection between uh, going from values taken by quadratic forms to uh, group actions on homogeneous space. Okay, so um, let me just summarize this part of it to say that uh, given, uh, this is the general recipe, given a problem in arithmetic or number theory, if there's a rich set of isometries associated to the objects in this problem, then it's sometimes possible to look at the moduli space of all such objects, act on the moduli space of all such objects using this, these isometries, and then use some techniques of erotic theory to say something about this group action and translate that back to the problem in number theory. So this is kind of the game that we are involved in. So this is uh, somehow this ergodic approach to problems in number theory. Okay, so this is uh, essentially the first part of my talk, and it deals with everything that happened up to Margulis's theorem. So uh, Margulis's theorem is not effective. Okay, so let me uh, explain what that means. It means that his theorem says the following: it says that if you take a quadratic form within three variables, which is indefinite and irrational, then uh, the set of, uh, it takes a dense set of values at integer points. So for example, if you gave Mercullus a real number like zero, Mercullus would say that there exists an integer vector x in Z3 
such that when you feed x into q, q of x absolute value is as close to zero as it is. So given epsilon positive, there exists x such that qx is less than epsilon. The problem is uh, nobody at that point knew how to find this x, what are good bounds on x and so on. I have to say at this point that in the first two slides, I reviewed some history where uh, there were lots of nice results by Davenport and, and Heilbronn and so on. And these are proved using something called the circle method. It's a very powerful uh, method, um, you know, goes back to Ramanujan, Hardy, and so on. And uh, one great uh, bonus of the circle method is that it always gives you these bounds. And one great defect of ergodic theory is that uh, till recently it never gave you these bounds. Okay, so now we ergodic theorists are trying to uh, remedy this situation. Uh, with uh, some modest progress. So uh, that's what I'm going to report on now. So the challenge is prove some effective versions of uh, problems in Diophantine analysis and also in ergodic theory. One interesting fact actually is that Marculus' proof originally, in fact, not only was it not effective, it used the axiom of choice. Okay, so that's as not effective as you can get. But this particular use of the axiom of choice was removed by Tani a couple of years later. Okay, so now we fast forward from the mid 1980s to the year 2013-14, where uh, Lyndon Strauss and Margulis proved a beautiful result. And the result says the following, they gave an explicit set of irrational quadratic forms for which they got a good bound, okay? So for which uh, they proved that you could get within epsilon of say zero, for example. So you can solve the inequality qx less than epsilon, and you need to look for x in a ball of radius roughly e to the one over epsilon. So e to the one over polynomial depending on epsilon. There are some constants here which depend on the form, of course, but let's not worry too much about it. Okay, so this is what I mean by an effective statement. It at least gives the first bound on the size of the integer solution. All right, so this was a very, very uh, beautiful result by Lyndon Strauss and Marcus. And then uh, we started wondering whether uh, this is in fact, uh, you know, best possible. And it turns out that it's, uh, in a certain sense, it's not. And so with my uh, co-authors, Alex Korodnik and Amos Nipo, we showed that if you, instead of taking an explicit set of irrational quadratic forms, if you settle, if you settle for almost every quadratic form in three variables, then in fact, you can do uh, quite a bit better. You can do better, uh, you can kind of knock out the exponential. So for almost every quadratic form, there exists an integer vector such that qx is less than epsilon and the norm of x is, uh, x can be found in a ball of radius one over epsilon, okay? So uh, these are two uh, kind of, contrasting statements. One of them is explicit, and that's a big thing, but it gives you a weaker bound. The other says that with probability one, you'll get a much better bound, okay? All right. So uh, there is uh, a little more in this paper. So there's, you, know, you can do, other kinds of things on uh, say uh, some homogeneous varieties, but let's not go there. So like I explained this uh, idea of uh, Raghunathan in uh, going back and forth from uh, number theory to the ergodic theory, let's do one more variation of it. Uh, so let me explain the idea of this result, which we proved, but how one can do something 
for almost every quadratic form. So similar to the Oppenheim problem, I want to now translate an effective Oppenheim problem. And uh, this is obviously, as you might have guessed, uh, now a quantitative equidistribution problem. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's recall that uh, the, the, the notation is the same as in the previous slide. So gamma is SL3Z, G is SL3R, and H is uh, SO21. Okay, so you know, you should think of the quotient of G by H as parametrizing quadratic forms. Okay, so you should think of this object as the family of quadratic forms. And I'm going to act on this family of quadratic forms by this lattice. And if I can say uh, something quantitative about this action, perhaps I can unwrap it to say something about quantitative or effective about the quadratic form. And this, uh, this is a direct translation. So I can take this theorem here about there exists X and directly translate it into some problem involving gamma acting on G for H. And then one does a further translation about making it into a problem about H acting on G1 gamma. And then one has a situation just like before. I have SO21 acting on SL3R factor SL3Z. In the earlier situation, the feature, I mean, the, the property of uh, SO21 that was crucial was the fact that it was generated by unipotent one parameter subgroups. Here, our strategy is different. We want to use harmonic analysis. Okay, and so uh, it turns out that uh, one can look at, uh, one can use, there's a rich theory of, uh, you know, um, harmonic analysis of semi-simple groups, going back to Harish Chandra. And one can bring a lot of these, uh, you know, very rich, beautiful theory into play when you look at a situation uh, of uh, a semi-simple group like SO21 acting on these probabilities. Such an action gives naturally a unitary representation of H on L2 of the quotient. And uh, for a function F in L2 of G1 gamma, one can consider an averaging operator. Okay, so if uh, some of you have seen uh, maybe a first course in ergodic theory, you would have encountered, uh, you know, ergodic theorems. And these typically say that uh, if you um, look at time averages over orbits, then these converge to space average. Right? This, this is Birkhoff's ergodic theorem. So you look at uh, an integral, say, from zero to t of, uh, you know, uh, you have some transformation t of x and you feed it into, you test it uh, against a function. And then you want this, uh, as t goes to infinity, you want these longer and longer pieces of orbits to equidistribute in your space. And so the integral should converge to the integral over the whole space of it. Okay, so this is Birkhoff's ergodic theorem in a classical form. And over here, we have a similar situation, but since we are acting by not by, you know, the action is uh, by a bigger group, we have to take averages over some more suitable uh, objects like balls in the group. Okay, so these HTs should be thought of as some suitable balls which are growing with T. And I'm uh, looking at time average. So these are like time averages. And if this, if this action is ergodic, which it is, then these time averages should converge to the integral of F over G mod gamma. Okay. Now the beauty is that 
because our action is by a semi-simple group, we can not only say that these averages converge to the integral of f over g mod gamma, we can come up with a rate. Okay, so this is what's called an effective mean ergodic theorem. And it says that there exists kappa positive such that for any f in L2 g mod gamma, if I look at these time averages, so the L2 norm of the difference of the time and the space averages can be bounded in the following manner. It's at most the measure of these ball raised to minus kappa times the L2 norm of it. Okay, so this should be thought of as uh, an ergodic theorem with a rate. And so this rate is very important because it tells us how fast h orbits on g mod gamma are equidistributed. And this is exactly the kind of information that might allow me to go back and say how large an integer vector I would need, okay? All right. Um, okay, so this is uh, basically the uh, strategy of this work with, with uh, Gorodnik and Milo. And uh, uh, this, uh, okay, so when you do something like this, uh, you need to compute this uh, kappa because otherwise you won't have any uh, kind of uh, rate in your quadratic form problem. And so uh, it turns out that uh, in this particular instance, namely if H is SO21 and G is SN3R gamma SN3Z, uh, it's an old result of uh, Kajdan that uh, the rate here is best possible. So it's, it's kind of, it's equal to two, so kappa is equal to two, and uh, you can't do better than two. Okay, so, uh, and somehow that's what, gives us this result here. So I'm just going to scroll back a moment to show the result. This result here that there exists x says that qx is less than epsilon and x is at most one over epsilon. This one over epsilon uh, in, in the sense of the measure is the best result you can hope to get. So with, you can't improve this result for almost every form. This can be shown using some uh, counting argument. And the reason that we are able to hit this best possible result is because that uh, this H action, SO21 action on SL3R factor SL3Z is uh, tempered. So this, this kappa is equal to two. So this kind of is, uh, it's a lucky coincidence that uh, this is temple, so we get the best possible. Okay, all right. So uh, maybe I'll state one or two more results in this way and then stop for questions. Um, so here's a way of uh, rephrasing the Margulis's theorem. Uh, it says that uh, if you look at, if you take sequences, so there are sequences, uh, n of k going to infinity and delta of k going to zero. So that for all sufficiently large k, if you take the minimum over all vectors n with norm at most k, evaluate qn minus c c is a real number, and look at the supremum over all real numbers with the absolute value at most n of k, then this whole quantity is going to zero, right? That's what, this is a rephrasing of uh, Margulis's theorem. Okay, so uh, Burgan uh, liked this rephrasing and he said that I can try to think of an effective or quantitative statement in, ta in terms of this rephrase. So he proved the following uh, beautiful result, which says that if you take a, a family of diagonal forms, a two parameter family of diagonal quadratic forms, namely these ones, uh, x squared plus alpha y squared minus beta z squared. And if you assume uh, standard, some standard conjectures about the Riemann zeta function, then you can get very sharp bounds on 
uh, n and delta. Namely, you can solve this inequality for fixed beta in almost every alpha, uh, as long as n and delta are related in the following manner. Namely, n of k divided by k to the eta times delta k squared goes to zero. Okay, so this is exactly in a similar, it's kind of a uniform effective version of Margulis's theorem because I'm allowing uh, this real number to vary over some, uniformly over some uh, larger and larger interval. So with the uh, Kelmer, we, uh, so this is a, a beautiful result which holds for diagonal forms in two variables and uh, with Kelmer, we uh, proved an analog of this result instead of averaging over uh, these two variable, uh, uh, two variable quadratic forms, we averaged over almost every quadratic form and we could prove a similar result. Recently, Tamara Schindler has generalized Burkan's result to higher degree forms. This is very recent work. All right, okay. So I think I'm almost coming to the end of my allotted time and uh, I have a lot of other slides. So I'm going to fast forward to uh, the most recent result that I have on this topic. So um, I'm, I'm missing some material, but that's okay because one usually has too much material and it's very important to finish on time. So I'm going to fast forward to a result which is similar to Burgan's result. This is a result of mine uh, joined with Vinay Kumaraswamy, who is a colleague of mine here at TIFR. So in Burgan's result, he uh, had a similar, exactly this family of quadratic forms, right? He had an, uh, of course, we, he called it alpha beta, we're calling it alpha two, alpha three. But this particular theorem has a new feature that it allows a shift. So this is what is called an inhomogeneous quadratic form sometimes. Uh, in other words, I'm taking, uh, fixing a, a vector in R3 and shifting my quadratic form by this vector. Okay, so this changes the nature of the problem and a lot of work has been done on the inhomogeneous forms. But uh, let me just uh, state this result of uh, Vinay's and mine, and then I'll stop. So we were able to prove an analog of Burkhardt's result. So namely, uh, if you fix uh, one of the parameters and let the other vary, then in averaging over this one parameter family of inhomogeneous quadratic forms with fixed shift, you can uh, get very uh, good uh, effective results. Um, you get almost optimal results if you assume um, another standard conjecture in number theory called the exponent pair conjecture. And even unconditionally, you can get some good results. Okay, I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? Hi, sir. So, is, is there any implications of, of whatever you've explained to mass forms on SL2 and SL3, maybe? And to mass forms? Uh, well, you know, uh, so the short answer is uh, no, but uh, the long answer is that, uh, you know, a lot of the technology used to study mass forms uh, is also comes up in this kind of context. So that's the kind of, so in that sense, they're related. Um, but otherwise it's kind of uh, not so clear, yes. I mean, after all, this is, you know, at the end of the day in this uh, spectral approach to quadratic forms, you're studying representations of, uh, SO2 one on this. And so, of course, it's closely related to, you know, 
automorphic forms and such things. So, right. So, so, that's why I asked, like, I felt it. So, if you're studying mass forms, you have to look at the action of SO2, you have to look at the action of the Laplace and all. That's right, that's right. So it's very much in the same ballpark with the, the difference a little, there's some difference. So, I mean, a lot of uh, things are common between ergodic theorists of my kind and people who study automorphic forms. You know? We have a lot of common ground, but uh, philosophically speaking, ergodic theories kind of use softer techniques. So somehow, um, so for example, uh, we, you know, the, an example of a softer property would be something like Kajdan's property T, okay, which is a property of uh, representations of uh, semi-simple groups. So it's a, it's a softer thing. And uh, if you can get away with using softer statements, then it's likely that your statements will be applicable in a wider range. Whereas uh, people who study automorphic forms tend to be usually more precise. And so uh, it's, this is a very you know, general statement. You shouldn't take it to heart. It's just a me making. Uh, so I would say that in when you are very precise with automorphic forms, you, you tend to prove results for, you tend to prove better results in a smaller domain. Whereas uh, with the recording theory, you tend to prove worse results, but they're more applicable. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, online audience. Yes, chat some questions. Yeah. 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 Yeah